Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm going to change the direction of the uh, discussion a little bit tonight. Uh, first of all, I had better mark down what time I started. <laughs> I prefer to brandish my Blackberry uh, <laughs> to do that. Um, and I'm going to talk about human rights and Canadian foreign policy, and I'm going to make just two points. And the first one is that as we properly engage in self-reflection here tonight and, and more generally on the, as we commemorate the issuance of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and as we inevitably in that process uh, reflect also on our own shortcomings <coughs> uh, which are significant, we should also take care not to belittle or underestimate the progress that we've made as a society. And to substantiate that point, I'm going to talk about how others see us, drawing on my experience at the UN uh, and elsewhere. And second, I'm going to offer some observations on contemporary Canadian foreign policy and human rights, and, and, uh, and I'm going to uh, offer some advice also so that we can maintain our reputation going forward. <clears throat> it was a Canadian, Professor John Humphreys, who had taught at McGill, who set up the first division for human rights at, at the United Nations and who ran that f division for 20 years. And in the early part of his uh, tenure at the United Nations, it was he who drafted, uh, in large part, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and who guided it uh, through the General Assembly to its adoption in 1948. And his accomplishments remain the standard by which the, the contributions of other Canadians to international affairs are measured. In my judgment, it's not just an accident of history that the Declaration was drafted by a Canadian. Tolerance, respect for others, and appreciation of diversity are all values that go deep into the roots of Canada. They're part of our DNA a DNA that's traceable back to the 16th century and the reception of the Europeans by our Aboriginal peoples and back to the 18th century when the English and French found themselves having to develop a modus vivendi in the New World. Our New World is not so new anymore and developing a way of living together is, is, remains a work in progress as we, as we saw with some of the um, decidedly unparliamentary language we witnessed uh, in Ottawa in the past 10 days or so, and also some of the intolerant commentary that was evident in the, uh, uh, in the uh, hearings of the Bouchard-Taylor Commission in Quebec earlier this year. But while it's important not to, romantic, not to romanticize our history, which has often been painful, especially to Aboriginal Canadians, but also to uh, newcomers as the many apologies uh, that our leaders uh, issue uh, tests. It is important, and while it's important to be honest and clear-headed about our contemporary behavior, as Ramesh is suggesting, which is short of the mark internationally and self-destructive sometimes at home, it's also important to recognize that we have made progress. During a long public service career, half of it spent abroad and over the subsequent years working with foreigners, uh, I come to understand that most of the rest of the world respects Canadians for the society we have created. Over the years, we have transformed ourselves into a compassionate, bilingual, multicultural society, perhaps the most diverse on earth, in which none is a majority, and where minorities can and do prosper. Take, for example, the city of Toronto. According to the most recent census, 52% of the population over age 15 was born in another country. That makes Toronto probably the most diverse city on the planet. The world knows we value diversity and that we integrate foreigners into our national life, not perfectly, but as well as or better than practically everybody else. We are seen abroad as a country that tries and mostly succeeds to respect human rights and to protect minorities, and that we're a country worthy of emul emulation, albeit one that should do better by its aboriginal population. And that is not a trivial reservation by the rest of the world for reasons that are evident or should be evident to all of us. 
So while self-satisfaction and complacency would be fatal to the Canadian enterprise, it remains nonetheless true that we are recognized abroad as a country which de delivers an, a very high quality standard of living and a, and a very important quality of life. We are known as a culture that generates remarkable excellence in literature, the arts, and science, and for education that propels its students into the top levels of accomplishment, with Laurier leading the way in some fields. Our economy ranks about 10th in the world. We are a major trading country. Our resource base is fast. We have some of the very best business people in the world, some of them right here in Waterloo. We believe our banking system is sound and hope. Our modest population is larger than that of over 150 countries, and even our much maligned defense spending, our defense capability, is actually 12th in the world uh, when measured in terms of uh, military spending. So for all of these reasons, I found myself invariably getting a willing, respectful hearing whenever I spoke at the United Nations, but it was especially because of our reputation as a bilingual, multicultural, law-abiding, compassionate, and welcoming society. When I spoke in the UN Security Council in defense of the International Criminal Court from the Bush administration's attacks on it, or on protecting civilians in armed conflict, or on protecting women's rights in Afghanistan, or on stopping the blood diamond trade in Africa, or on avoiding what turned what was evidently going to be a catastrophic war in Iraq, my words carried weight because I was the representative of Canada at the United Nations. Over many generations, but especially